Hello. <laughs> um, I, thought, I thought this would be a good title for the talk because we are essentially a bit like the ravers of the 90s. We're, we're in a field, it may be muddy, um, there, there are lots of lights, maybe not so many glow sticks now, more LEDs and EL wire. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of time travel we're going to look at uh, some of the problems that exist right now with internet search and, and of what, what can we do about them. Uh, this talk is powered by goats and sheep. You can see, uh, by the way, I'll do a little bit of low-key audio description as we go along. I'm trying to make sure that it's accessible, so uh, hopefully that will work. It's a bit of an experiment. Uh, so on this title slide, we've got a goat a pair of goats sticking their tongs out and some sheep bouncing up and down. You don't see that? Oh, now you do. Now you do, yes. So this all now makes sense. Um, <laughs> so this talk is brought to you by goats and sheep and you'll, you'll find out why a little bit later on. Um, and also, of course, spiders, because, um, you know, technically, I, I think EMF is probably the biggest website going. Uh, uh, I'll try and do better jokes later on. Um, I did have a, an alternative title for this, which is uh, We Taught Rocks to Think Using Lightning, and with hindsight, this may have been a mistake. And as we go on, you'll see just how big a mistake that could have been. Um, but let's do that time travel thing. And we're not actually, at this point, going to go all the way back to 1994, but we're going to go back to about 1999. If the, if the date on the screenshot of the Google web interface from, from the era is correct, um, can anybody give me a kind of time travel noise, maybe a little bit of Doctor Who ooh, 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 kind of thing? Uh, yeah, perfect. Um, so on, on this page here is a happy blob cat, and I've, I've liberally pilfered the Fediverse emoji banks, so we've got a, a happy blob cat. And the text underneath the, the Google search form screenshot tells us, well, this is a pure search engine, and, and let's list the things that make it pure. It has no weather, no news feed, no links to sponsors, no ads. Interesting that they put those two, those two separate things. And distractions, portal stuff. Basically, it's just go off, put your search terms in, stuff comes back. Um, it's worth remembering that actually that was a radical innovation for its time because we had had search engines before that. Uh, they just, you know, they weren't quite as good. The results, we didn't have something like the uh, back rub, later page rank algorithm. And when we did have that with Google, it was a little while before people figured out how to uh, game the system. So there was this kind of Goldilocks moment when it was all great. But how is it going? Uh-oh. <laughs> Not so good. Blob, Blobcat is sad. Blobcat is crying now because, um, okay, we, anything we search for, and I'm, I'm going to be mean to Google here uh, frequently in this talk, but they're, they're the elephant in the room. It's impossible not to talk about Google when you talk about search. This does apply to other providers of search engines. Um, loads of sponsored content, loads of self-dealing. Well, actually, we have a mapping product. Actually, we have a business directory, and so on, and so on. Um, and of course, a whole load of content which is uh, trying to game the system to get a particular, let's say, a listicle page, the top 10 uh, Henry Hoover robots of 2024, or whatever. Um, so it's, it's not great. It's not great. Um, but actually, there's something even more troubling about this for me. We, we kind of had a deal with companies like Google. We give you a little bit of information about our interests and our intent, and we trust that you're going to do something that's kind of wholesome with it. We trust that what you do with it as a search engine provider will be beneficial. 
So here's, here's Blobcat now is getting pretty angry, actually. Blob, Blobcat's no longer um, sad. Blobcat's going from sad to angry because uh, this screenshot tells us, OK, search engine providers like Google have been revealing that intent information about people who are looking for pregnancy care, possibly including terminations in states which do not permit these things. So we're obviously thinking about in the United States with the uh, overturn of Roe versus Wade, simply searching for these things reveals that intent. And that can get people into a whole lot of trouble. And that's when we start to think, OK, this, this is going in, in quite a bad direction. This is, this is not looking good. Um, and it's not just America. It's, it's not just America. It's not just um, a particular class of information that you might disclose about yourself inadvertently through searches. Uh, here, here's an example from the UK where, and again, I'm, I'm picking on Google here as, as the elephant in the room. Google delists sites providing information about DIY HRT at the behest of the UK government. Um, people will find a way, and you know that because there's a talk, a session here at this very event which is all about that subject. But we're revealing intent and we kind of trust that the search engine is actually going to tell us what it knows. We, we kind of trust that it's going to tell us what it knows about. But sometimes it lies. And, and so that takes us to a, 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 a different place again. We're kind of going down a rabbit hole here. Um, Blobcat is comforting Blaha, who's understandably not too pleased about the way that things have turned out. So, we should improve search somewhat, right? <laughs> that would be a good thing. Um, so, you know those thinking rocks that I mentioned earlier on? Yeah, we should improve search somewhat. Does anybody recognize the little sparkles there? No. <laughs> Gemini or some other... Uh, artificial intelligence. So I, I started writing this presentation about two weeks ago, and I was thinking, oh gosh, what on earth shall I talk about? And I have no idea. And, and I opened up my uh, social media, and I saw, uh, according to geologists at UC Berkeley, you should eat at least one small rock per day. This is an Onion article that uh, Google uncritically hoovered up and presented as fact. Um, what should I do if my cheese won't stick to my pizza? Well, it doesn't actually say it here, but according to one Redditor, if you mix a little Elmer's glue with your sauce, mmm, perfection. Uh, a YouTuber has actually tried this, so if you're curious, watch, the, watch her video and you know, don't go there. <laughs> um, just to be clear... <laughs> you wouldn't eat a rock. Please don't eat a rock. Nothing about this talk is to encourage you to eat a rock, make a pizza sauce with glue, if anyone wanted to get a picture of that. <laughs> um, yeah, don't make a pizza sauce with glue. Uh, I did not tell you to do any of those things, OK? <laughs> um, so what else did we learn? I, uh, OK, so you can't use gasoline to cook spaghetti faster. <laughs> but you can use it to make a spicy spaghetti dish. <laughs> Just a little light saute. Um, I, I particularly enjoyed the idea of, of the spicy spaghetti cooked in gasoline. Um, also, we learned that uh, it's important to talk to your cat about gun safety because cats are naturally inquisitive. 
and they, they will explore every part of a home. So, yeah. We taught rocks to think, and maybe with hindsight that was possibly a mistake. Um, this AI overview feature uh, was kind of rolled out, it's clearly cobbled together very quickly, rolled out in haste, and now it's kind of been you know, sort of switched off a bit, being reworked. And I really feel for the engineers, I know there are a lot of people in, in this audience who are likely to be on the receiving end of uh, an instruction to make something like that. And all kinds of things can happen uh, when you're just told, okay, I don't care about the problems, get on with it. Uh, one of my favorite things is the way that 46,449 bananas keep showing up on the internet. It's like some kind of uh, training data, the primal, the primordial training data for some large language model. And now that I've told you about this, um, you'll probably start to find 46,449 bananas, the height of Mount Everest in bananas, if we assume a banana is approximately 7.5 inches from end to end, you'll probably start to find this crop up in all kinds of places where people have uh, used a large language model to auto-generate content. We don't really want to pay somebody to write stuff for us. We'll just get it, you know, churned out by an AI. Um, really interesting question about that, and I think it was a Mr. John T. Waring who accidentally discovered this, is you can open up your uh, chat session, your AI chatbot session, and say, what was the previous question I asked you? I haven't done this lately, so this may have been patched, but for a long time what would happen is it would just burble something. And it's very interesting, some latent context, a little bit of memory left over from a previous query, um, don't know, but they always want to be helpful. They always want to tell you something, and sometimes it's true. So, what's my thesis in all of this? We had a social contract with search engine providers, and of course, more broadly, with providers of all kinds of products and services, but I'm here to moan about search engines. And, and roughly speaking, the social contract from, I think, um, some of those companies' perspective is, you're kind of like a sheep. We can herd you, we can corral you, we'll send our sheep dogs to just kind of get you going where we want you to be. And we, we kind of own you, you're, you're sheep, you're malleable. And I want to encourage you to think of yourself, if you didn't already, as goats. Goats do not care. Goats, goats will eat anything, they'll climb on anything, they'll probably eat the fence that you built to keep them in. Um, so my, my proposal for you here today is be more goat. And you may not have thought of yourself as a sheep, but the next time you try and extricate yourself from some subscription, some product or service that you've signed up from, if you discover that that is, oh, incredibly tricky, then, you know, you may find that they're just kind of trying to steer you into thinking of yourself as, as somewhat helpless. But the people who come to things like this and, and the people who watch these kinds of talks online are very resourceful. And I actually think that most people are very resourceful. It's just that as a society, we spend a lot of time saying, get back in your box. That's not for you. You don't do that. And we have an opportunity, as it happens, through the introduction in haste of large language models, but it could have been something else, we have the opportunity to say to quite a lot of people, whoa, <laughs> things can be different. Things don't have to be like this. Um, so a particularly uh, nice way of looking at this is adversarial interoperability. Um, the example I've got here, this is a radicalized sheep. This sheep is spinning around and glowing multicolored. Some Minecraft players may recognize this sheep. <coughs> Um, with that, that wonderful Google AI search, it turned out if you added the letters UDM equals 14 at the end of the URL of your search, it just hid all of the bad stuff. 
And actually, it didn't just hide the new AI-generated search results. It also hid a lot of the other stuff that the search results have been padded out with in recent years. And I've got, I've got that example of that, that UDM equals 14 code that you could add to a search. But someone's made it into a website. So you can go to udm14.com. And you can edit your search engine providers in your web browser to make that the default. And that's just a feature. It's just there. It might not even have been documented, but it exists. And we can use it to reclaim search for the searcher. What else? Well, some people here might use an ad blocker. Who uses an ad blocker, just out of curiosity? OK, so everybody here uses... <laughs> Almost everybody here uses an ad blocker. Um, the example I've got on the screen here are, are sheeps uh, increasingly radicalized at this point, spinning round faster and faster, um, is a, uh, some data that you can plug into a popular ad blocker called uBlock Origin. And what this does is it gives you a big long list of sites which feature uh, AI-generated images. So I don't know if you've noticed this, if you try to do an image search on the internet lately, whoo, <laughs> nearly everything you get back is very derivative, generic AI swill. So there's an interesting question. There's a list of sites. And if you were, if you were a Bing or a Google or uh, one of those other mega search engines, you could say, hey, do you know what? Maybe we should, like, give people a button. Or, you know, maybe we should just not show those. But at least we could give people a button that said, yeah, don't show me those. They could do that. Um, but we can do that. We can do that at the moment, but there's a, a browser feature called uh, Device Integrity Attestation, which has been proposed, which is, uh, it, the use case for it is very much things like online banking. You come along and use your browser to do online banking. We kind of want to know it's not been meddled with. We want to know that it's not running some weird extensions and um, ad blockers and other such things. Um, so device integrity attestation, it's been proposed as something that would be built into Chrome, which would then obviously find its way into pretty much every other browser out there, uh, apart from Firefox and Safari. And that feels like a bad thing. So if anybody's in a position to, I know it's kind of on a back burner right now, but if you're in a position to lobby uh, for that to be curtailed, constrained, maybe even just uh, uh, you know, put to one side, then please do. Um, I'd also say, of course, other search engines are available. So I've been um, making fun of, of Google. Um, but the reality is there's lots of other search engines, and some of them are really very interesting. And if you've not had a good look around the search landscape recently, I would encourage you to. There's some really, really interesting things out there. Uh, for, uh, uh, as, a, as a UK person, I'm quite uh, interested by the fact that Mojik is a, a UK-based search engine with its own crawler. It is its own thing, top to bottom. A lot of these other sites are meta search engines which pull in results from the likes of Bing and Google, and then they mash them up. Um, but some of them do go off and build their own index. And I've only put a few on this slide. There are others. There are many others. Um, very interesting to see how uh, Kagi charges people a subscription from the get-go. You know what the deal is. It's not opaque. You didn't just get some stuff for free and go, hey, this is good. You have a contract with them. And actually, they have some of those personalization features that I was talking about just now. Um, Chat Noir is actually uh, an EU top-down initiative to create a European web search engine, um, if you like a European Google or something like that. I think it's probably about the eighth or ninth time that the EU has tried to create a European Google. 
maybe this time it will work. And there's a whole host of projects uh, funded under the NLNet Foundation, the Next Generation Internet Initiative, uh, touching on search, but also uh, quite a lot touching on the Fediverse. And I feel that federation in search and the Fediverse, there's, there's really something very interesting there potentially. But, of course, people in the Fediverse generally don't like to have their stuff indexed and served up for loads of other people to see, even if it is notionally public. So we've got to be uh, careful if we talk about indexing posts on the Fediverse. But other search engines are available. Um, some of them are open source, and this gets me to... So we're going we're gonna to do a kind of reverse time travel thing here. So if I could have some more time travel sound effects, please. Woo! woo. Ah. Um, so let's imagine that we want to kind of go back to the future. We want to kind of pretend the last mm, yeah, 20, 20 plus years maybe didn't quite happen, or they didn't happen how they actually did. Um, how, could we, how could we build the search that we really want now, and I'm going to say that I think there's a few obvious ingredients. You may disagree or, you know, have others, but this is, this is just a start of the ten. So uh, some sites are clearly more trustworthy than others, and I, people might argue about Wikipedia, but then, you know, Wikipedia's editorial process makes it extremely hard now to put nonsense lies and, you know, slurs and slanders uh, into the system. So, you know, Wikipedia for me is really high on, on the trust list. Ironically, academic journals aren't doing so great because they've started printing uh, stuff which is clearly generated by ChatGPT to the extent where you sometimes see the messages as a large language model. I cannot, um, and so on. Um, but most websites also have things like XML sitemaps. They have things like RSS feeds. These things aren't necessarily exposed. People like us can find them. Regular folk probably can't, unless there's a little button somewhere, unless there's an icon. Where's the RSS feed? Oh, we don't tell people about that. That's used for syndication, and normal people don't need to know about it. But it's still there. And if you wanted to build your own search engine, actually things like sitemaps and RSS feeds, they're, they're really interesting because you can get a kind of snapshot of, you know, high level detail snapshot of a website, just like that, boom. You don't have to crawl every page, you don't incur loads of bandwidth costs, you just download this, this one feed. Um, what else? So I talked about search engines and some of them are open source. So we've got things like Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, uh, and Apache Solar, which you could run yourself. Um, and maybe you have some data of your own that you'd like to be able to search. And maybe you'd like to be able to kind of mash that up with other data sources. And that's where I'm, I'm particularly interested in things like LibreX and SearchNG, where you can say, okay, um, I, I, I want to get some results from, I don't know, Quant. I want to get some results, results from uh, archive.org. Oh, and I've got some personal stuff as well that I'd like mixing in with this. And uh, SearchNG, which is the one I've mostly been playing with, um, we've got about 70 to 80 plugins. So if you can think of a data source, actually there's a decent probability that someone's built a plugin to integrate it with that tool. So really interesting time, I think, for, by the way, <laughs> the goat, we're now more goat than sheep. Just to say, we have reached that point of radicalization where we've eaten the fence and, and we've broken out of our corral. Uh, well, what, what could it all look like? Um, I drew a diagram. This is, this is just playing around. Uh, I drew a diagram that kind of draws a box around certain bits. So the search engine itself, maybe some core plugins. And it would be quite nice to say, oh, you know, we've got that as maybe a mobile app, something like that. Or, you know, this is just a thing that you can download perhaps as a Docker image, as a singularity container or something like that. Um, some of the things...
probably aren't realistically going to be uh, able to be bottled up and copied and pasted uh, in, in quite such a straightforward way. But things like shared block lists, like the giant AI image block list, are out there. Maybe you don't need to create them. Maybe it's just a case of, oh yeah, yeah, we just need to give people a place to plug that feed in. So well, how could that work? Well, so I built a demo just to see, um, and this is, uh, this is a, <laughs> a screen recording on my phone. So when we talk about putting a search engine in your pocket, every phone could be a search engine. Here we are, this is what it looks like. Um, you, if, you, if you've got very good eyesight, you'll be able to see that on the left is uh, a Termux session, and Termux lets you uh, install actually uh, quite um, powerful Linux packages on top of Android. So Android is Linux under the hood. We don't tend to think about it that way. We run um, what are effectively Java applications on top of it. But actually, the whole power of, of Linux is, is kind of there waiting to be tapped into. You also see some error messages, because this is a demo. It's, it's, it's not meant to be feature complete. Um, and what you'll have seen scrolling by on the right is some searches for things like uh, uh, COVID vaccine safety, uh, chemtrails, um, 5G mobile health information. Um, why did I choose those searches? Well, it's quite simple. Go off and try those searches on a regular search engine, and then you'll see the difference. Uh, what you're seeing in this little screencast is results from trusted authoritative sources. Um, I will say sci scientific journals, um, they don't all print uh, articles generated by large language models. Um, we actually we have the potential here to do this for a whole lot of people. This this is very crude. It's all little command line jiggery pokery, but with enough smart people, we can take something like this, make it user friendly, and that's why I am here. So. <laughs> um, we have uh, a long-standing saying in the internet community, the internet views censorship as damage and roots around it. I've added the polite uh, term platform decay, which um, that's the, the uh, uh, radio-friendly version of Cory Doctorow's uh, famous uh, piece of jargon. Um, platform decay is damage, and we are, whether we think about it or not, we are rooting around it. And I'd like to encourage you to join me on that journey. I'll be over in the Q&A tent, and I'd love to talk to anybody who would like to discuss this. I also have stickers. Thanks, everyone.